My name is uh, Joy Kimiwe, uh, wife to pastor or Bishop Ken Kimiwe, Sita Mngong, uh, my mother of two young adults. In, in um, April, 25th of April, I was married for 31 years. <laughs> And I'm saying this to say I have been young, and now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children beg for bread. Don't you think after 31 I have a right to say I was young and now I'm old? And because of that, I've just given something to our sound tech, Bethwell, to produce, uh, rather to uh, project for me because uh, of the theme verse for Sitam. The people who are talking here were saying this is Sitam. Please be adding Sitam Eldoret so that when they come to Nairobi, they can come to the other Sitams as well. So this is Sitam Eldoret. And we were led, which was OK, through the vision and mission. But we were doing the vision and mission of the church. So in this place, you need to do the vision and mission of women ministry. It is a little different from that. Anyone who knows, I won't ask the vision and mission. Don't show them yet. Anyone who knows our theme verse, please stop looking at the screen. Titus, yes, three to five. What does it say? You don't have to cram, just say. Just shout from where you are, one thing. Are, are you there? <laughs> just shout something, anything that you know. Older women to teach younger women. Let me read it for you. Now you can put it. Now you can put it, Beth. So uh, now that I'm an older woman teaching the younger women, and we have this um, vision and mission for, for WM, allow me to teach the younger woman in Sitam Eldoret. Our Titus uh, verse, which all the WMs of Sitam stand on, is Titus 2, chapter, rather verse 3 to verse 5. And it says, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. And it goes on down there to say, to teach, mold, equip, and prepare, sorry, to teach the younger woman, it is not on the uh, flyer, but to teach them how to love their husbands, how to be hospitable, how to do things. In this time and age, maybe they would have said how to balance their work, their ministry, and their families, how to take care of their children, how to live in the society. So I have come here to teach you some of these things, not because I'm better than you, but because I was born a little, old, I mean, earlier than some of you, not all of you, than some of you, and by God's grace, I've learned a few things. So today we are not going to to be in church and we'll not be doing hallelujah, we are going to learn. I'm going to teach us as I teach myself. So the first thing I want to just mention before I go into our uh, message for today is that we have a WM vision and mission. Are you able to see? It looks a bit hazy. Are you able to see from where you are? No. Okay, let me read it for you. Sorry. That is a flyer for Sita Mgong. That is a flyer for Sita Mgong, but that is where it is. So our vision is, maybe you will repeat after me, a vibrant Christian woman equipped to impact her world. A vibrant Christian woman equipped to impact her world. That is the WM all round Sitam, the WM vision. The mission is to teach, mold, equip, and propel. Say that. To teach, mold, again, to teach, mold, equip, and propel the woman to use her gifts and talents 
to serve and transform her world for Christ. To teach and mold, to teach, mold and equip the and propel the woman. To use her gifts and talents to serve and transform her world for Christ. So the next moderator for 20, rather for June, that is what you will be repeating. Repeat it until it comes from here through the other side, because that is what we stand on. You cannot teach what you don't know. We cannot move the women if we don't know where the overall WM in CITAM is going to. So we need to know this verse. We need to know the vision and mission of WM, even as much as we know the one for the church. Buana Sifiwe. Am I still your friend? I'm still your friend. You did well, so I'm not judging you. I'm just introducing the WM one because this is women ministry and we have it only once in a month. So when we get together as women, we can then be able to go through that. So I was given a very tough um, topic to share, and that's why I'm saying I will not be preaching. We will share the word of God. We will learn from one another. And just remember, as I speak to you, I'm speaking to myself. I have not yet attained. Bad on a jifunza every single day. Buana sifiwe. So it is work-life balance. Work-life balance. I want us to open Exodus chapter 20. It will be on the screen as well verse uh, 10 and 11, and then we'll go to verse, uh, chapter 31, verse 15. Exodus 20, 10 and 11. At least that one you can be able to see. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. But he rested on the seventh day. Chapter 31 verse 15 says, Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. For six days... Uh, work is to be done. But the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. It was that serious. Is to be put to death. Wow. That is serious. That is how serious God wants us to have rest. One cannot talk about life uh, and work, and let me add ministry balance, without talking about rest. Do you agree with me that women don't know how to rest? Women do not know how to rest. Women, I included, think the world revolves around them. And if they don't, who will? Unfortunately, when we drop dead, God forbid, Oh God, the world runs. It goes on. One day my, when my dad died, I was 25 years then, I heard one of my elder sisters say this and it broke me. I thought when my dad dies, the sun will stop, the moon will stop, and the world will know that a big man has fallen. But people are laughing, they are joking, they are cracking jokes, they are enjoying eating. They're actually enjoying being here in this funeral. As a 25-year-old, it broke me. But I learned something. One day, I will die, and the world will go on. That one was a big lesson to me, and I hope it will be to you as well, that the life goes, I mean, life goes on, with or without you. Uh, some years ago, I, I left work in 2018, voluntarily. But where I was working, there was a very good friend of mine and 
she was very sick, she got cancer, and with time, she died. But when she was getting, uh, when she got so sick that she could not be in the office, uh, we got somebody to replace her, not we. The organization got someone to replace her. So while she was in hospital, somebody else was sitting on her desk. And where I was working, when you call, the name of the person shows on the screen. So after she died, every time I called to talk to whoever was on her desk and her name showed, I put the phone down. And let me tell you, my colleague was replaced before she died. So the things we are talking about, and thank you, leadership, for thinking about this kind of topic. They are so serious. Did you hear what the scripture said? Anyone who does work? should be put to death. I know we think Sunday is Sabbath. It is not sab Sabbath. Some of you come here at 6 o'clock and leave at 6 on Sundays, especially that pastor who is looking at me and the pastor's wives. <laughs> By God's grace, I've, I've been privileged to be in Israel. On Friday, from 2 o'clock, there is nothing happening. Restaurants are closed. Shops are closed. There is no vehicle in town. In fact, it is just the tourists like us who would be all over. But we are looking for a place to buy things and they are not there. Do you know why? They have gone home to cook and get ready for the Sabbath. Both born again and non-born again. Drunkards and non-drunkards. At least for the weekend, they don't drink. They go home, stay with their families. So they cook, get ready everything on Friday. On Saturday, it is Sabbath rest. You won't find any restaurant open or shop. Now they've started opening, I guess, because of uh, the, the world standards and the tourists that are there. But we need to learn to rest. Even if it is not on a Saturday or Sunday, find your own Sabbath that you rest. I know pastors in Sitam, quote unquote, rest on Mondays. Rest, Pastor Petronila, you rest on Mondays. But that is the time you remember to go and see your mother and you remember to buy your husband this and clean the corners which your house girl doesn't clean. <laughs> remember, eh? And pray and fast. Mm, that is her Sabbath. <laughs> it is very serious that we take the Sabbath seriously. So if you forget anything I said, because I have a lot of things to say. And please bear with me. I have really prepared for you. I may go a little overboard beyond the time we normally do. I've taken this as a seminar, but I will not take two hours, I promise you. Even the men went overboard for the same reasons, I believe. You don't come from Nairobi to Eldoret to talk for three minutes. You've come a long way. So do I have your back? Is that OK? At least I have asked you. Amen. Let's move on. So balancing professional and personal life can be challenging, yet it is very, very vital. Work, and I've put stroke ministry, usually takes precedence over everything else that one does in life. And then the desire to, to succeed in ministry, the desire to succeed in your profession, in your career, can push you to set aside your time of well-being. You know, you put it aside, you know, forget that you need to rest, forget that you need to do certain things for yourself. How many of you have a me day? Me, me too, the joy day. Serious joy day, Martha day, Miriam day. Hmm. I see people shaking their heads. Please don't feel guilty when you go to Sirikwa Hotel and sit there and have you a nice meal and wipe your mouth and go home and then cook. Those 
those of you who travel by plane once in a while, they say, just in case uh, they, 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 there'll be no oxygen, the masks will drop, blah, 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 blah. And then they talk to the mothers with children. They say, put on your own mask first before you help others. What does that mean? You need to have guarded yourself without your mask, without rest, without taking care of yourself. You can drop dead and not be able to take care of that child if you don't have, quote, unquote, oxygen. Put on your life mask first. Be at your best. Rest, play, do exercise, sing, relax. Then you can be a better wife. You can be a better employee. You can be a better employer. You can be a better mother. You can be a better sister. You are not being selfish. You are being wise. Many times, Jesus took time to go and rest. Let me not go ahead of myself. The desire to succeed professionally or in ministry can pu uh, push us to set aside our own uh, well-being. We sacrifice our well-being, creating a harmonious work-life balance or work-life integration is so critical. This helps not only to improve your physical, emotional, and mental well-being, but also Importantly, for your career. You also improve your career by being the best you can be. If I gave you work, ministry, family, God, what would be the priority? God, then? Don't say what I'm supposed to hear. Say what you think. <laughs> God, family, work, ministry? Mm -hmm. Whatever uh, others, whatever you say, it is God, then family, and family includes you. Then the rest can come. I normally tell my husband, or I used to tell him in the earlier days, he, hey, the, the guy was busy, not that he's less busy. An absent, don't tell anyone. An absent father is an absent father, whether they are preaching or drinking. Ouch. <laughs> the child does not know that he's away for good reasons. He is away, full stop. An absent mother is an absent mother. An absent sister is an absent sister, whether they are drinking or preaching or visiting, doing visitation. Visiting the widows and the orphans, they're still absent. Say, ouch. So what is work-life balance? Can you see those hands? Oh God, you're touching the cart, you're touching the flowers. Oh my God, you're shopping, you're in the office, you're on the phone. You're taking tea at the same time. One, two, three, four, five, six hands. Oh, that is a perfect picture of a woman. One day I saw a video, I have looked for it, I can't find it. I'll look for it until I find it. A video clip. It was daddy's day to be on duty at home. So mom had gone out and daddy was on duty. So daddy was supposed to be marinating <laughs> the chicken and feeding the baby and doing other things in the kitchen. So the Wazungus have this thing where you prop your chicken to be able to marinate it. You know? Um, but unfortunately, there was a football game. So he had put his iPad on the kitchen, you know, uh, counter. Then he was supposed to be feeding the baby and cooking and marinating the, the chicken. He had propped the baby on that thing for marinating the chicken. And he was busy putting nyanyas and vitungus. And the baby was eating, eating, feeling nice. And he was saying, go on, and whatever. And he was um, trying to stir the soup that was on the rail, but he was doing it on the counter at the same time. He's trying to multitask, but he can't. But for women, God has given you the opportunity. You can be able to do that. You can kick the cat as you talk to me on phone and eat at the same time. Let's make use of that 
intuition. I've borrowed heavily from a man called Chris Chancy, and he is a career expert and a CEO. And most of the information I'm sharing is from him. So what is work-life balance? Let me move faster now. Work-life balance is the state of equilibrium. That is, the state in which opposing forces or influences balance. You have two important forces or things or influences, and you need to balance them. You need to balance them. Women, psychologically speaking, um, are indeed multitaskers. You can do a lot of things at the same time. My husband says if a man is chewing gum and he has to cross the road, he has to stop chewing first, cross the road, then resume chewing. Otherwise, at a gongwa nagari, I'm at a juma. But for women, we can do those things at the same time. But that does not mean we overdo. Choose and prioritize. Put a balance. Put a balance. One equally, in, in work-life balance, you equally prioritize the demands of your career stroke ministry and the demands of your personal life. Some of the common reasons that lead us to poor work-life balance include, shout, shout it. Yes? I wish I had a, a mic that is moving around, but anyway, just shout. You, you are reading my things. Me, I want you to say yours. Anyway, increased responsibility at work. Anyone else, something that is not there? What can make you not balance your life? Somebody help mom so that she's not the one walking around with the joy. Now I know your name, you're in trouble. First of all, tell us what you think <coughs> before you give somebody the mic. <laughs> what are some of the things that make us not to balance our lives? Uh, concentrating on one thing or having multiple thoughts at the same time. Uh huh. Of course, I've put them there for you. Yes, somebody there. Two ladies there. Things that make you. Financial pressure. As she goes on. Job instability. Instability at work. I want to add, yes, ma'am. Lack of organization and planning. Just yes, shout as the mic comes. Oh, can you clap for her? Trying to please everyone. I learned that no is a sentence with a full stop. So it is okay to say no. And you're still born again, going to heaven. But you said no, I can't handle this. Increased responsibility at work when you are promoted, for example, working longer hours because there's too much work, increased responsibilities at home, there's a new baby that has come and you have adopted another one from your sister who passed on, God forbid. Starting a family, having children, and many other things, they can cause you not to be able to balance your life. What are the benefits of life balancing? Balancing your work, stroke ministry. I keep saying that because we are in church and your life. A good work-life balance career expert has numerous, I mean, numerous positive effects, which includes uh, uh, less stress. That is a suggestion he has given. Less stress, a lower risk of burnout, and a greater sense of well-being. This benefits both the employee and the employer. When you balance your work and life, or your ministry and your own life, you are better, a better person. You are a better employer, you are a better employee. Employers who are committed to providing environments that support work-life balance for their employees can save on costs, they can uh, experience fewer cases of absenteeism, 
you know how people keep calling in sick and they're not sick, including those ones who are speaking in tongues and they're sitting here looking at me? And enjoying a more loyal and productive workforce. There are people who, some companies these days, they even have a crash in the office place. And you can come with your baby and maybe a house girl and when you need to breastfeed, you run there, breastfeed. Don't you think when you know that your baby is 100 meters away, you will work better? You are not imagining that the, ha I mean, the house girl has left her in the room, I mean, at home, locked and gone for a walk. You will be more at peace. And I'm not saying everyone should do that. I'm just saying employers should have better environment, especially for women, to work in. If you don't have a house girl and there's no daycare near you and you are allowed to bring your child to be playing, you go check on her and come back, don't you think you will work better? By the way, even if you brought, you know that ka playpen, that ka thing where we put babies and they jump, jump there. They're jumping there as you work. Imagine you can multitask and you will be at peace. In fact, maybe instead of leaving at five, you may leave at seven because the baby is there and you are at peace. Buana asifiwe. Employers that offer options uh, such as telecommuting, you know, you can work on phone, or flexible work schedules can help employees have better work-life balance. So if you are an employer, make the environment so good. Most of us are employers. We have house girls. I have a girl, she's the age of my firstborn. This girl is wonderful. She does a good job. But when she tells me she's going to clinic, I actually give her one month leave at the end of the year paid. One month paid. Not because I have a lot of money, but my employer used to do that for me. Why can't I do that for her? When she comes in January, she's glowing. Apart from her offs, because she has to go to church. On Saturday, she comes half day, or sometimes she asks and stays, because I'm thinking, when will she wash her clothes? I know I'm paying her, but she has a home to take care. How do I talk to women about how to take care of their husbands and homes when I'm keeping this one in my house 24-7? And I don't deduct, because she was not at work. I don't calculate per day. Because I realized when I was working, once in a while I'm unwell. And I could just do with that day without somebody saying, feel in, leave. Let me tell you, I know there are some who are just bad, whether you try anything or not. So I'm not judging you for the ones who come and go. But when you treat them well, they appreciate and they'll give you good, long service. So you have a chance as an employer to, go, to make a good work environment. There was a time I allowed her to come with her baby. She had nobody to leave that baby to. My children are big, so what should bother me that there's a, a toddler in the house pulling things? The mother will take care, as long as she will clean and do whatever she needs to do. Let's not be too strict. Let's not be too strict. I know earlier on in life, when you are a young mother and you have to stamp your whatever, you don't come, you don't get your pay. You don't go on offs on Sundays because I'm very busy at church. Say, ouch. So how to schedule one's life? I need to move faster. When creating a schedule that works for you, think about the best way to achieve balance at work, stroke ministry, and in your personal life. I keep adding ministry because some of us live in church. I'll come back to that. Work-life balance is not necessarily dividing the hours of your day evenly between work and personal life, no. It is more of having a flexibility to get things done in your professional life or in your ministry while still having time and energy to enjoy your personal things, to just know when to do what. You are not supposed to sit and do nothing. Why are you doing nothing? And that's why some of you bother your husbands. What are you thinking? What are you doing? Let me tell you, he's thinking nothing, and he's doing nothing. For real. He's just sitting. He has the ability to do that. You don't. So please, cut off that voice of your mother 
that keeps telling you you must be washing utensils, you must stand. Some of you, we invite you to our houses and you, oh, me, mom, pastor, you can't do this. When you leave, I'll still do it. Allow me to serve you. Enjoy it. When you do to your home, you, you go to your home, you'll do it for yourself. Hallelujah. Please don't feel guilty and hear your mother's voice saying you should not sit around. And please don't do that to your children. You know how you say, what are you doing here? You just like to sit around. Mom, I'm just chilling. And you're thinking chilling is a sin. What are they chilling doing? They should be up and about doing things. Let me tell you, when they are on holiday, they sleep during the day and watch things during the night. So they are de des I mean, desperately and seriously and genuinely tired. I'm not saying we encourage that. But once in a while, when they feel like doing nothing, and they say, Mom, ni me choka. Of course, you may choka at your age. Do you know how old I am? Sometimes they're actually just tired. They're human. They are human. And they're tired. I'm not saying they sit around the whole day. No. But give them a break as you give yourself a break. Every woman or every mother says, Amen. Amen. So there, are, there may be some days when you will work longer hours, so you have time later on in the week to enjoy the activities. It's just knowing when to do what you have to do. I want to give us some ways, eight ways of creating a better work-life balance while being positive. Mm. Eight ways to create a better work-life balance while being supportive, either as an employee or an employer or a mother or a sister or whatever you are in life. Can somebody help me kindly? Just help me open this. It has refused. <laughs> Number one, accept that there is no perfect work-life balance. By the way, I won't give you 10 stop steps of balancing your life. So there's no perfect one. It's according to the kind of work or ministry you do. It's according to your personality. It's according to your family or the, the largeness or, mm, or smallness of your family. It really depends on the case as it is. Thank you. Thank you. There is no perfect work-life balance. When one hears the fresh work-life balance, one probably imagines having an extremely productive day at work or at church, and later on joining the family and friends to do their own, I mean to have time with them. This is the ideal but it is not reality. Don't strive for a perfect schedule. Strive for a realistic one. Realistic, not perfect, not ideal. Some days you might focus more on work, while other days you might have to focus more, I mean, your energy to pursue your hobbies, your, you know, things that you want to do, spend time with friends, spend time with loved ones. I'll talk a little more about this later. Balance is a process. It is achieved with time. It is not something you start today and you are running with it. You train yourself. You train to listen to your body. You train to listen to your mind. You train to listen to your gut, as it were. And eventually, you get the rhythm and you know how to move. The way mom, Rose, will balance her life is not the same way you will balance your life. Please don't emulate her teacher. She has holiday, <laughs> although these days it's just two weeks or less. Don't emulate somebody else. Have your own, create your own. In fact, one of the ways to do it is getting, not a prayer partner, she could also be a prayer partner, but um, what do I call them, an accountability partner, who will ask you, Mom Ross, how many times, I mean, hours did you rest today? What did you do to rest? Find somebody who will tell you off and tell you you think life will not go on when you die or if you die, if you drop dead. Get an accountability partner, they'll help you. 
So it is a process. It doesn't happen immediately or once. It is not an event. Flexibility is a very important component in assessing where one is in regards to their goals and priorities. Sometimes the family meets you more, and other times you need to travel. Other times you need to, you know, remain open and redirect yourself and just know I need to do this. Just find your own way of balancing. Number one, accept that there is no perfect way. Be flexible. Do it over time because it is a process. That's simply what I'm saying. Number two, find a job that you love. Hey. How many of us do what we love? For real. You know we are in church. You enjoy and love what you do. You could do it without a pay. The hands are going down. Okay. <laughs> so most of us are victims. I will tell you about my life in a short while. But although work is an expected social norm, we are all expected to work, even the Bible says if you do not work, you do not eat, your career shouldn't be restraining you. If you hate what you do, you are not going to be happy. Please repeat that to your neighbor. If you hate what you do, you are not going to be happy. <laughs> You don't need to love everything about the work you do because there are times when there are downsides and upsides. But you need to be excited enough that you do not dread waking up every morning to go to work. It is recommended that one finds a job that one is passionate about that you can do it for free. Yes, you get a pay, but even if you are doing it for free, the way you serve in church, you would be a happier person. And God has a way. And I'm not saying you all resign and do what you like. <laughs> but God has a way of rewarding you as you serve humanity and as you serve him. If your job has become a burden, you may be working in a toxic environment for a toxic person or doing a job that you truly don't love. If this is the case, it is time to find a new job or business, your passion. When I was growing up, um, when I finished high school, there's something I wanted to do. I wanted to do communication. And my dad came from up country, came to Nairobi where I was. I had been admit, rather, admit, uh, what is the word? Admitted to Daystar University, it used to be called Daystar Communications College, something like that, to do communication. But my dad came and said, no, 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 you know this is a Christian university, you don't know whether the degree is credible or not, why don't you just do this, then later on you can. In our days, do you know what the girls used to do? What? Hmm? Teaching, nursing, which is a noble job. Secretarial. So I went for secretarial for one year. Of course, I excelled. But you know, in our days, you just do it because daddy said. Let me tell you, if my dad wanted to pay for me in Daystar, he would have afforded it and he would have done it. But he thought it was not good for me. Good girl, good daughter, yes, sir. And I did secretarial. But by God's grace, he led me into beautiful places where I really, truly served him. But after some time, uh, I hear my husband giving this story. Let me quickly give it, cutting it short. Uh, when I was expectant with our firstborn, he had just left his profession to go to Bible college for four years. And when I was three months pregnant, I was laid off. So those are two jobless, new, upcoming parents. Yes. Before I go on with the story, that was the time I knew there was a God in heaven who provides, who is real, who is tangible. 
By the way, he has to take us through those experiences so that we can be able to teach the younger women what you yourself have gone through. So that when somebody says they don't have money, they mean that. When they say I don't have food, they actually mean that. Been there, done that, so I understand. So when you're going through your downs, just know that experience will not be wasted. So uh, I was doing two jobs here and there, but at one point, Pastor White's secretary had gone on leave, and there was a new uh, MD for one of the uh, corporations then, or the, the, the parastatals, and he was an elder in our church in Sitam, sorry, NPC then, Nairobi Pentecostal Church, Valley Road. So as they're coming out of the office with Pastor White, he says, oh, you said you're looking for a secretary. Joy here is a very good secretary. She's just relieving my secretary, blah, 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 blah. Long story cut short. By then I was very expectant. I was eight months pregnant. And somebody called me and said, come for interview. By the way, I didn't, I didn't get what they were talking, so it didn't click. I didn't know who was calling. And I was called and I went and I told them by the, before, when they called, I said, you know, I'm newly married, I'm expectant, I'm eight months. <laughs> I'm, I'm rather too honest. Should I still come for the interview? He said, yes, please come. So I went, I was in my 20s, late 20s, so I went and he told me, if this job is yours, nobody will take it away from you. I was employed, I was given a letter uh, admit, what is the appointment letter, and told, go home, get your baby, win your baby, and then report. <laughs> yes. I did that and reported. And because I was a new mother in an, a big office, thank God for this secretarial, I used to be taken home at lunchtime to breastfeed and back to the office every single day. Every single day, I went home to breastfeed and come back to the office. This is our God. I loved and enjoyed that before I didn't. But with time, you get tired of doing the same thing. In fact, I was so used to it that I used to hold three phones at the same time. So-and-so's office, good morning, hold on. So-and-so's office, good morning, hold on. Then I go back and answer this one, answer this one, answer this one. Until at home, I used to say so-and-so's office <laughs> when the phone rings. That is our God. I loved it, but after some time, I got tired and went into other things, administration and so on. But at one point, I was taken to, oh my God, to a department I did not like. I didn't even know what that animal was. But I landed there. I would ask questions and I'm just, you know, moved around, nobody really bothers. I took myself to school for nine months, learned whatever that was. That was an animal called procurement. I hated it with my passion. But I did it diligently. Do you know what I used to do? When suppliers are crying, I started canceling them because that was my passion. So I would go with them to a room, cancel them, pray for them, then we move. Cancel them, pray for them. Then I thought, wow. Then when staff are having trouble, they are bereaved, they are having issues in their marriage, they come to me, I cancel them. I said, wow, I think I'm doing the wrong thing. I should not be buying goods and services. I should be dealing with people. And I had been doing that because now I was a pastor's wife. I do small courses here and there. But I just said, ah, ah, I'm going. I went to school, went to pack a master's, and did what I enjoy to do. I'm not being paid right now, but I enjoy it thoroughly. And when I'm in Sitam, everyone knows that is mom, so they don't, they don't expect to pay. I still do it, as unto the Lord. And I'm enjoying myself. Not because I have a lot of money, but God has a way of rewarding. Please don't do what you don't like. Please don't think you are 50 or 40 or whatever, it's too late. No, you can still go to school and learn that thing you like. If you are a business person, give it a try. Don't struggle to do what you don't like. It will even be so hard to balance. 
Let me tell you, the first class I went, psychology class I went to in AIU in Nairobi, what used to be called NEXT, I was saying, where have I been? What was I doing? Let me tell you, I excelled because I was doing what I love. I had a family, I had ministry, I had a crazy job, I was traveling all over, but I did that degree in two years instead of four. When we were graduating, I'm telling you how to know your passion and what you love. When we were, we were graduating, I didn't even know, because I didn't have time to look at, as long as I didn't fail. Next, I did blocks. So, on the day before graduation, I asked somebody for the program. I looked at it, I didn't understand. <laughs> I had never graduated before. So I'm looking, the names are not alphabetical, they're not in any, also I'm thinking, what is all this? We are being told, sit here, sit here. Do you know what I discovered? I was graduating with honors, with a very high GPA. I had no idea, because that was my passion. <laughs> my teachers would call me and ask me, who does your papers? I say, what do you mean, who does my papers? I do them for myself, by God's grace. You know how people do things for others these days? By the time a lesson is over, the teacher would be asking for my notes. You know why? Secretarial, I was typing 100 words per minute. So I would go with my computer when the class is going on. By the end of the service, I have my notes. And all the classmates are asking, and I send them on. I give them. Of course, there were some lazy ones who are not writing because they'll get from me. I still gave them. I still gave my teachers. So even that which I didn't like made a way for me. Praise God. I was sharing this to say do what you like. Please don't push yourself. It's not too late. Even if you are 50 and above, it's not too late. I know a lady who changed her career in her 60s. Of course, she had retired, but she changed around. She became an author, and she's sailing on high. It's never too late to do what you wanted to do. There's a, a quote by an unknown uh, writer, or, or rather author, which says, it is never too late to be what you might have been. It's never too late to be what you might have been. Buana asifiwe. There are some people who are promising to change, to do the right thing. Please don't leave your job before you're sure. Don't leave your job before you're sure. Number three, prioritize your health. Why health? What is health? Health is not the absence of pain. Health is mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, all round. That is health. Prioritize your health. Your overall physical, emotional, mental health should be the main concern, first and foremost. Because if you're not well, one of the things we were asked to, uh, uh, to, to say five blessings. One of the things I told Mom Rose, and I'm sure she wondered, was sanity. I'm able, able to think I'm not impaired, I'm not confused as I'm talking to you. That's a blessing. That is health. If you struggle with mental health or chronic illness issues, it may be necessary to seek therapy or help from a professional. Christian women, please don't be afraid to see a professional counselor. The same way you keep saying, I saw the doctor, we have a family doctor, have your family psychologist, have your family counselor. Go there not because you have issues. We think when you go to a counselor, you have issues. By the way, who doesn't have issues? I know I've lost all my clients. Who, who doesn't have issues? Okay, who has issues? We have issues. By the way, sometimes it is as simple as not knowing whether to do this or not. When you go to a psychologist or a counselor, they'll help you open up and see things from a different way. Say, have you tried it this way? Just making a decision. If you are struggling, go see them. They won't be surprised. Uh -uh. They will be happy to open up and help you see it from another. That is their job. Go and say, I'm so confused. I was used to telling Mze, but Mze is not here. Now I don't know how to make this decision. My husband has traveled. I need to make this decision. It is urgent. What do you think? They will give you some insights. 
Don't be afraid of having issues. See a professional. I normally tell people, when simple things begin to overwhelm you, that's a red flag. You want to make ugali. You've done that for years. You put the water, you reduce and say it is too much, then you add and say it, it, it is too little, then you reduce again. When you are reading the Bible and you read the same sentence 10 times, when you go to the ATM and forget your pin, red light, my sister, see a professional, even if it is a pastor to pray with you first. Don't be afraid to look for help from a professional. Women are used to, uh, oh my, I hope you're able to see these things. They're too small. Women are known to vumilia. Vumilia roho yangu. Inayo choma. Banana umba unisaidi. Hey, msiendele. <laughs> so we are brought up to vumilia. Unaskia kicha, you have migraines, you have that sharp stomach, whatever, but you are a strong woman. You don't go to see the doctor. Hey, seek help. Go for checkups. Don't say tutaona kesho. I know most of your husbands, for those of you who are married, you want to first observe. Eh? A child has temperature and he's saying you observe, and they're not hearing me. Even this one with the camera is not hearing me. <laughs> what are you observing when the boy's temperature is boiling? What are you observing when you're in so much pain? Pain is good. You know why? Pain tells you there's trouble you need to check. When you have high blood pressure, it's 200 and you feel nothing. You go and everyone is running around in hospital and you're thinking, what is wrong with them? That is dangerous. So where there's pain, whether emotional, physical, whatever, that is a telltale sign. sign. Please seek help. Let me move. Avoid overworking because it prevents one from getting better, possibly because you, rather, uh, uh, causing you to take more days off in the future because you're overworking. So you'll have to make up for the time you overworked. Tell your neighbor overworking is a sin. <laughs> Prioritizing your health first and foremost will make you a better employee or employer or person. You will rarely miss work because you are at your best, you are resting, and you will be happier and more productive. So prioritizing your health doesn't have to consist of radical extreme activities. Just balancing. Just making sure you are OK. And with age, you feel more unwell sometimes. Be careful not to overdo things. You cannot do what you did at 25, at 50, or 40. Don't be afraid of unplugging. You get the volume. Don't be afraid of unplugging. Taking off. Cut ties with the outside world from time to time to allow you to recover from weekly stress and give you a space for other thoughts and ideas. You can have a day when you just put off all your gadgets as an individual or as a family so that you can communicate with one another. Sorry, this is somebody I was quoting. But taking time to unwind is critical to success, and it will help you feel more energized when you are on the clock. Jesus always retreated. He always unplugged. Many times he says, let's go to the other side, when the crowds are too much on this side. Do you remember him sleeping in the boat? He took time to sleep. Remember him reclining at the table? I imagine they were creating, cracking jokes and laughing and saying how C.G. Judas did what and how Peter thought he was a, you know, a superman and tried to walk on the water. He took time to recreate. He took time to pray. 
And when things were thick, he took time to now go either with the three or alone now to the Father and cry out to him. If Jesus did that, why can't we do that? Unplug and don't feel guilty. Tell your ministry leader, tell your boss, I just need to take some time. I really need these five days. I really need just these two days, even if it means filling in. Take the two days and go have time with you. Maybe time with your family. When the children begin not to uh, perform in school, in class, maybe it is time to take an off. Go sit with this boy and say, hey, I've, I've noticed ABCD, instead of scolding them, because if you're stressed, you'll scold them. Say, I've noticed ABCD, you know, you've, of course you've brought them chips and whatever, and they're feeling nice, so they will talk to you. Don't feel guilty to unplug. Take a vacation. Sometimes truly unplugging means taking a vacation from time to time, shutting off from work and ministry. There's a study that was con uh, conducted in the US and 52% of the employees reported having uh, unused vacation days or leave days left over at the end of the year because they were worried that taking time off will disrupt, disrupt the workflow and they will be met with a backlog of work when they return. This fear should not restrict you from taking the much needed break. You are not indispensable. The benefits of taking a day off outweigh the benefits, or, or rather the downside of it. With proper planning, you can take time away without worrying about burdening your colleagues or contending with a huge workload. And even for ministry, I know you are the worship leader. I know you are the leader of uh, whatever group. But imagine you need to be training people so that when you are not there, things are going on. By the way, you realize this is the third Saturday. So all Sitama are having their WMs. What am I doing here? I should be in Gong. But Ngong is running perfectly without me. Perfectly. Don't be insecure and not uh, train other people. Let me give you an insight for those of you who are leaders in the women ministry or leaders, wherever else. You have your group, small group. Divide them into four. Put a leader on each one of the groups. Let them be the ones reporting, you know, whatever, so they report to you the four of them, or three, depending on how big the group is. If you can do it zonally, the better, because they come from the same place, they can decide to pray together at eight o'clock, they can decide to do things together, visit one another. So you reach those four groups through your four leaders. Let me tell you, you will t find time to balance ministry, work, and home. Delegate. Remember the, the Jethro kind of wisdom? When Moses was sitting and judging and doing everything, he was told, learn to delegate. Vacation doesn't have to be at White Sands. Vacation doesn't have to be at Sirikwa. Vacation doesn't have to be at which beach. You can go to an Airbnb. You can go to Shago if it is quiet and nice. Okay, not to work very hard for the family during Christmas, making 100 chapatis. <laughs> By the way, you can go to a home, a retreat place, even just in town. People don't need to know you are there. There was a time I was feeling like, hey, this is too much. I told my husband, I'm going somewhere, I'll be here in the morning. Because he trusts me, he didn't ask a lot of questions. I went to that place and just talked to myself, talked to God, cried, laughed, did nothing, and went back home the following day. And I felt nothing. I was OK. It was necessary. He's not the one who was stressing me, but I needed to be alone. There are times you need to be alone with God. There are times you need to be alone with yourself. You're saying, God, if you don't come through, if you don't come through, because in the home there's too much noise from the babies, from your husband, from your mother, from your siblings. 
mara sijui alikuja akachukua sijui nini ya mama mara akafanya you need to just be alone taking a vacation doesn't have to be expensive number six, make time for yourself and your loved ones no matter how hectic your schedule might be you and time I mean, ultimately have control over your time. Create a calendar for family. You know, I've just gone into the middle of it, but I'm simply saying make time for yourself and for your loved ones. Remember, everyone is, irrepla is replaceable at work. And no matter how important you think your job is, the organization will not miss you a bit tomorrow if you're gone. They'll come on Friday, bury you on Saturday, go to church on Sunday, and go to work on Monday. Set boundaries at work, and I mean, and work hours. In these big offices I used to be, I remember telling my boss, you know I'm a pastor's wife. This has nothing to do with work. But from Friday evening, you will not see me. So don't ask me to come to the office. Of course, I didn't put it in those words. I'm just saying, be assertive. Tell the people you work with you, what your schedule is, what you think. They will know, and they will respect that. I didn't used to go, but when I left that office, people were living there. Even on Sundays, they were there. Even on Saturdays, they were there. The same office I was for many years, and I never appeared on a, on a Saturday. Set boundaries for yourselves and your colleagues to avoid burnout. When you leave the office, avoid thinking about you know, the projects in the office. It is recommended that setting specific work hours when one has to work from home. That is if your work allows you. People would usually understand and respect your work place limits and expectations if you speak about them and they know. Set goals and uh, priorities and stick to them. That is number eight. Set achievable, underline achievable goals by implementing time management strategies, analyzing your to-do list and cutting out some of the tasks that have no value or little value. Pay attention to when you are most productive at work. Like for me, mornings are the best. So I wake up early in the morning, that is when I do my preparations. Because in the afternoon, I cannot do that. In the evening, <coughs> I'm finished. So you need to know, when are you most productive? Avoid checking your emails and phones every minute when you're working. <laughs> Say, ouch. Structuring your day can increase productivity at work, which can result is more free time to relax outside work. What did I say? I said, number one, accept that there is no perfect work-life balance. Number two, find a job that you love. Don't do things that you don't love. Number three, prioritize your health. Remember, physical, mental, emotional health. Number four, don't be afraid to unplug, to retreat, to take time off. Number five, take a vacation with family or with yourself. Number six, make time for yourself and your loved ones. Know when to go for those dinners and whatever's and you know, just a time out in the afternoon. Set boundaries at work and work hours. Number eight, set goals and priorities and stick to them. I want us to stand for a little while before I just conclude. Just let's stand up. At least I warned you. Somebody can take us through coconut. Who knows coconut? Yeah, come, come. You've just given yourself away, come. Clap for her, at least she has volunteered. <laughs> or did she? <laughs> okay, maybe up they can see you better. There are some who are blessed like me with height. Come, please help us. Make space for yourself.
we know let us see. Let us see. So go like this. See. Pastor is doing it wrongly. Again. I'm I'm a fanya heavy. C is actually like this. Go a little lower. She wants to do it for you first to see. C O C O N A. Okay. So one more time. O C O N A. In fact, T, you can do this. T, they can do it on one leg. <laughs> do it one last time. C O. Yeah. Oh, help us, Lord. So one more time. C O C O N A. Clap for yourself. Wow. Wow. I would have ended here and finished the lesson. But why tell you about work-life balance without telling you a little bit about rest? Just a little bit. So resting to bring balance. Let's open Matthew, resting to bring balance. Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That is Jesus saying. He is actually saying, you see how I set priorities? You see how I know when you have to have 5,000, uh, a crowd of 5,000, and a crowd of 12, and a crowd of three, and how to be alone. He's saying, you see how I can sleep in the middle of a storm because of peace? You see how I have to retreat to the mountain to talk to my father alone? Take my yoke, learn from me. He actually gave us the perfect example. So what is God's perspective of rest? This one I'll run through very fast. God is interested in the whole person. That is your body soul and spirit. By the way, Jesus said, and you will find rest for your souls. When the soul is at rest, the body is at rest, the mind is at rest. So God is interested in the whole person. He wants us to be at rest in all areas of our life, soul, body, and mind. He wants us to be at peace with all men, that is Romans 12, 18. When rested, then we are at peace. Jesus, our greatest example, is the Prince of Peace. And you find rest, or you find peace when you rest, or you find rest when you are at peace. The two can be interchanged. So we are all busy, busy, busy. We are created to work, yes, and fend for ourselves and for our families. But we get so busy running from one place to another, from one fellowship to another, from one church to another, from one crusade to another. So we get so busy that we forget about ourselves and we even forget about God. Let's be honest. How many of you, you are so busy in church, there's a program going on, but you get to church and you remember you forgot to pray? 
My hand is up, but today I prayed. None of you, you've never found yourself so busy for God that you've forgotten about him. Yeah. You're blessed. It is possible. We neglect our families, we neglect our spouses and children, and we are at work or at business or at church. We are on phone, we are on gadgets, we are traveling. In fact, these days when people go to visit their grandmother, they sit there with their grandmother, so she's trying to talk, but everyone is on their gadgets. Starting from her son, who is your husband, to you, who is the wife, to your children, who are the grandchildren. We are seeing grandmother, but we are on our gadgets. And we get out from time to time to answer a phone. At times we neglect everything else in the name of ministry. True or false? Jumping from home to home, fellowship to fellowship. We are too busy. When we fail to rest, what happens? Mental health conditions and diseases come in. When we fail to rest, we have dysfunctional families because many people backslide when they're not restful. They start looking for something to give them an up. Some begin to drink, others begin to abuse things. I'm talking about born again Christians who are going to heaven or who are going to heaven and then something happened. Because if your husband or your wife or your child is not rested. Won't there be quarrels and things? And those can escalate until the family is either dysfunctional or the marriage actually breaks. Most marriages and relationships break because we don't rest. Alcohol and substance abuse, I've talked about that. Lifestyle diseases come in, high blood pressure, sugar and whatever, mental illnesses. Burnout and stress. I'll talk a little bit about burnout and stress. Loss of livelihood, you lose your job because you're not pro productive, you lose your business because you're not making ends meet. And there is also low life expectancy. By the way, in Kenya, the expectancy uh, years are 66, meaning most people at 66, they are ready to die. God forbid. In UK, it is 81 years. They live that long. And this is uh, low life expectancy that is attributed to bad health, uh, poverty, medical things. So people in some of those countries like Britain, their health care is taken care of, so they're not worrying about, suppose I fall sick, or oh, nobody will take me to hospital, I'm now old, my children are gone, no. They're not worried. They know the government will take care of that. What is burnout? Very quickly. This is a type of exhaustion caused by feeling constantly overwhelmed by prolonged physical, mental, and emo emotional stress. Feeling constantly overwhelmed. Please, if that is what you feel, seek help. So what is burnout? This is emotional exhaustion, emotional depletion and work-related exhaustion, depersonalization, yani mpaka unajitoa from the scene. You don't want to be part of what is going on a decreased sense of personal achievement or competence in one's work. You feel helpless, you feel like a failure, you feel like you're not achieving anything. Every evening you're thinking, so what did I do? You work so hard, you're so tired, but you can't show what it is you are doing. That is a red flag. There's somebody who said, burnout develops as a result of chronic exposure to stress as a result of long-term perceived inability to meet situational demands. You are unable to meet any deadlines. You know you are sick to a point where somebody touches you with a finger and you feel pain. The whole body is feeling pain. You can't think, you can't reason, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. I know most ladies are always tired. That is a given. But when it's a bit overwhelming, please check. 
when you go to hospital and the doctor can't see anything wrong, don't be quick to run to Mchawi and say ni wachawi. You could just be burning out. What are the causes? Quickly, bad theology. What do I mean by bad theology? This is mainly responsible for high levels of burnout and at, uh, attrition in the ministry. Many Christians have gotten the message that to deny oneself means to live in denial of one's humanity. You forget that you are a human being. And there are certain needs and things that you must do for yourself. We have convinced ourselves that serving wholeheartedly means neglecting the needs God has created us for our bodies. You neglect rest, you neglect exercise, you neglect uh, recreation. We have forgotten or ignored the command to regularly practice the Sabbath. Oh, we are all guilty. Remember the word said, those who don't rest, put them to death. You could put yourself to death by not resting. There's a quote by somebody called Josh Sparklock, which says, if we are not careful, we can get caught up in works based uh, on mindset where we earn approval from God by uh, sacrificing our bodies. Most of the time, the families on the altar of ministry. Sacrificing ourselves on the altar of ministry. We are serving God, but we sacrifice ourselves, our bodies. I'm not talking about living sacrifice. I'm talking about doing things, ministry, at the expense of you, your health, and your family. So bad theology is one of the causes of burnout, that I must be in church every day. Of course, unless you are employed by the church like our sister, Pastor Petronila. Number two, misplaced priorities, identity, value, and worth. Those things are misplaced in our lives. Our priorities are at times in the ditch where we focus on our wants, wishes, and what we believe will be able to make us happy. Instead of realizing our God-given priorities for our lives, that is our spouses, children, self-care, enjoying creation, engaging in ministry, we get over-focused on some others of his priority for us and neglect others. Another thing is unrealistic expectations. For us, the answer to how much more can I give is always more. Even when you have already given too much. Nothing is ever good enough, and we live with a constant feeling of guilt that we did not do enough. Is there a witness in the house? Always feeling you have not given your best. You need to do more. You need to do more. We walk about giving this or the other 100 and 10 percent. You can never give 110 percent. God is not even asking us to give 100 percent of our time. He knows we need to sleep, we need to eat, we need to take care of our families. And if we do 100 percent, then we will be very thinly spread. He reminds us in Psalm 103, verse 14, that we are made of dust. So unrealistic expectations can cause you to burn out. Poor work and personal boundaries. Hujui ufanya kazi wakati gani? Hujui rest wakati gani? You don't know when to be home, when to be in the office. For some of us, we mix everything up. I told you, boundaries simply put are how we use our word yes and no to manage our lives. Yes and no are sentences, full. You can say no and you can say yes. When then, uh, when we are overcommitted and allow others to control our lives, you know, uh, there are other people who dictate what we do in our lives. We would rather avoid the conflict and guilt, that is false guilt for that matter, than 
speak assertively and I mean assertively and put boundaries. Instead of telling people no, I cannot go for that visitation. I know that I'm the group leader, but please go. I have something to attend to. We cannot say that because if we say that, then we are not good Christians. Somebody says, you cannot give what you do not have. You cannot lead others where you yourself have not gone. If you do not take good care of yourself, how then do you love others in the same way that you love yourself? So you need to rest. You need to do self-care in order to take care of other people. The Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But most of the time, we love just the neighbor. Another thing is inadequate self-care. Self-care, self-care, self-care. I cannot overemphasize self-care. The buck stops with you when it comes to self-care. It's not your husband or children. It is you who decides what you do and what you don't do. You also cannot enjoy the abundant life that God has created you for if you don't, I mean, uh, by experiencing all the good gifts and blessing he has intended for you if you don't take care of yourself. Romans, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. So you can't treat your body the way you want. Without going into uh, details, causes of burnout are bad theology. For example, I need to be in church throughout. I must do all the visitations. I must sing in the choir all the Sundays after practice every week. Number two, misplaced priorities, identity, value, and worth. Number three, unrealistic expectations, especially for women. There's so much that is expected of us, and it is unrealistic. Number four, poor work and personal boundaries. Kueka mipaka. Kueka mipaka tu. Kusema yes and no, and let it be what you mean in your heart. The next one is inadequate self-care. Those are the things that cause burnout. Even if you forget the details are put there, those are the things that cause burnout. In conclusion, I'm simply asking some questions. Are you a superwoman? Please ask your neighbor that for me. You need to learn to rest. Tell her. Tell her, your neighbor. You need to learn to rest. You've heard of this thing that they say, mama wants to go and sleep. So she says, ah, I'm off to bed. Then she passes through the kitchen, packs the lunch for the children, passes through whatever, arranges a few clothes, passes upstairs, and a person goes, mze, zakesho. Mze anasema, naenda kulala. Anampita, anaenda, anangorota. In three minutes, mze is snoring. And mommy who left 20 minutes ago, is still, quote unquote, going to sleep. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. I want you to ask your neighbor this and mean it. If God rested, who are you not to rest? Please ask again. Pastor Petronila. <laughs> 